Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my turn now, and uh, I would like to tell you that I have a shorter presentation because I'm not suffering from this godfather's voice. And uh, my topic is quite interesting because I'm going to speak about uh, occupation, about American occupation of Rhineland after uh, First World War, which is a topic that is not known uh, very much. So this year marks 100 years since the occupation of the Rhineland began following the First World War. And in contrast to the occupation after 1945, this first occupation has almost been forgotten, as I said. After the First World War, the victorious powers decided to occupy it, uh, a part of Germany as a guarantee that Berlin would fulfill the armistice conditions and subsequently also fulfill those following signature of the peace treaty. The United States of America became one of the occupying countries along with France, Great Britain and Belgium. Their position, however, was made difficult after uh, US Congress refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. This is quite a wide topic, and as such, in this short paper, I have decided to focus on what I consider the three main problems, uh, while uh, also taking note of the different opinions of various American uh, representatives. The first of these problems was the very question of whether to occupy the Rhineland or not, and the different ideas of President Wilson and General Pershing. Another problem is in the administration of the occupied territories and disputes between the civilian and military officials. While the third problem involves the end of occupation and uh, the issue of the US role in Europe or in Germany following the First World War. Even before signature of the armistice, leaders of the Antan powers and the United States of America considered how they should deal with Germany in the event of victory. The prime ministers of the Antan powers came up with their plan for concluding an armistice, which, however, military leaders considered too lenient. Francis Marshall Ferdinand Foch proposed an alternative involving the occupation of the land on the left bank of the Rhine and a number of bridgeheads on its right bank. A dispute subsequently arose between President Wilson and General Pershing over how to support an armistice. Pershing supported harsher conditions for the armistice and uh, uh, as such, he also supported occupation of the Rhineland. In the beginning, President Wilson supported his arguments, the Pershing's arguments, uh, writing in his uh, third note to Germany that the conditions for armistice must be strict. A few, day, a few days later, however, he changed his mind. On 28th of October 1918, he sent a telegram to his friend, Colonel Edward House, whom he sent to Europe as his representative in the negotiation on armistice conditions. In it, he urged him to support less strict conditions, and I quote now, because it is certain that too much success or security on the part of the Allies would make a genuine peace settlement difficult, if not impossible. <coughs> he then argued against General Pershing's position and even rejected the option of the occupation of the Rhineland as a guarantee. Both men, however, uh, President Wilson and General Pershing, agreed that the armistice must, ha uh, must have uh, must have German, uh, German capitulation as its goal. They differed, however, in the harshness of the surrender terms. At the turn of October and November 1918, a number of key negotiations took place between President Wilson's representative, Colonel, uh, Colonel House, and other allied representatives from which the conditions of armistice eventually emerged. In the end, the occupation of the Rhineland as an important condition for armistice was supported by the British as well as the French. Okay. 
France acquired almost half the territory on the left bank of the Rhine. Uh, the Belgians only only small territory uh, territory on the on the north, and the British and Americans acquired the Rhineland's key political and economic centers. That is Koblenz for Americans and Cologne uh, for for the British. At the start of December. Uh, 1918, selected Allied armies began to occupy the Rhineland. During the first weeks of occupation, the territory found uh, itself under military administration only. Of the, you can see the, the numbers here, that uh, three quarters of a million men involved in the Rhineland occupation and American units made up almost a third of these men. Uh, there were high uh, expectations as well from the American side, and I quote, we are here to help build a new government to take the place of, uh, of the one we have destroyed. We must feed those whom, he, uh, whom we have overcome, and we must do all this with infinite uh, tact and patience and a keen appreciation of the small, uh, smart that still lies in the open wound of their pride. Then American, uh, American army uh, created a special, uh, special force that was named the American forces in Germany with later with General uh, Henry Truman Allen in command for most of this, of this time. The number of these uh, soldiers, uh, however, continued to fall until they were eventually just a thousand men strong. <laughs> Negotiations on the future of the Rhineland continued even during the Paris Peace Conference. It became more apparent during this conference that Great Britain and the United States of America, in particular, would resist French efforts to secure the Rhineland's secession from Germany and the creation of a buffer state in its place. As historian Kate Nelson points out, and I quote, the great irony of the occupation was that rather than draw the allies together, it drew them further apart. Behind the facade of allied unity in the Rhineland, significant tensions were developing, particularly between the French and the American armies. The Paris Peace Conference demonstrated that the powers had differences of opinion, not just on the Rhineland's future, but, uh, but also the future of the whole of Germany. While France and Belgium demanded the occupation of the Rhineland to ensure their security, the United States and Great Britain only took part in the occupation because they considered French control of the Rhineland to be incompatible with global security. So in the end, a compromise was reached in which the Rhineland was to be divided into three occupation zones, each of which was to be ev uh, evacuated progressively after five years. Once the final decision regarding the Rhineland occupation had been taken, the most important task was to uh, determine the nature of administration of the occupied territory. This was a dispute between the military and civil leaders uh, on who had key powers. In the end, the latter were successful in the dispute. Thus, the Rhineland Agreement came into force along with the Treaty of Versailles, transforming the nature of the occupation in a significant manner. The Rhineland Agreement ended the first phase of the occupation, which had been marked by the significant power of military leaders, many restrictions for the civilian population, and the martial law. In January, 1920, however, the US Congress refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, effective, uh, effectively condemning American representatives on various inter-allied commissions to the role of mere observers with no voting rights. This effectively resulted 
in France having greater influence, now holding decisive influence with Belgium's help within occupied territories. The dispute between <laughs> this, uh, the dispute between military and civil representatives also played out within the American uh, representatives of the occupying administration. This involved the American commissioner, uh, commissioner uh, on the inter-allied Rhineland High Commission, Pierre Pont Noyes, and commander of the American Occupation Army, General Allen. Both men had different opinions on America's strategy in the occupied Rhineland. At the Paris Peace Conference, Noyes had defending the creation of a civil administration in the Rhineland because he feared French military ambitions. In contrast, General Allen decided in line with the American government. that he would act independently within his territory so that they were, uh, Americans were not dragged into problems between France and Germany with uh, USA, uh, with USA had, uh, had, uh, had not caused. As a result of this position, he often came into conflict with Noyes, who accused him of not understanding the situation in the occupied territory. The two men, two men's dispute came to a head during the 1920s uh, crisis in the Ruhr in regard to the Cap Putsch. America's uh, State Department and Oh, well, it was it was quite uh, quite interesting because the two two leaders, one civilian leader uh, of United States of America, and the second one, which was uh, which was the leader of the of the army there, came into 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 problems during during this crisis, and uh, in this uh, during this crisis, America's State Department and Department of War both praised uh, Allen's position. In contrast, at least according to the state secretary, Noyes' excessive emotions and failure to manage the situation cost him his place as the American commissioner on the Inter-Allied Rhineland High Commission, or short, uh, High Commission. Uh, you mean uh, during this this uh, this time, this, this during this crisis? It was the the problem of of uh, the, the the policy that uh, France wanted to to form a buffer state in the Rhineland. It was the the Brit the um, uh, U.S. U.S. policy was similar to the British policy at uh, that time, and the British and the Americans wanted Germany to be united. In fact, and the France started to uh, to support, for example, the separatists in the Rhineland to separate the the Rhineland from from the Germany. And it was the problem between the France and the United States and Britain as well. The issue, the issue of the end of the American occupation the issue of the end of American occupation of the Rhineland appeared quite early in relation to the, to the change in the presidency. Wilson's policy was condemned already in the Republican election manifesto. The, vo uh, the vast majority of the country voted for uh, the Republicans' promise uh, return to normalcy. Historian Kate Nelson wrote that, I quote, uh, Americans were simply not ready to think of themselves as part of the European world. Neither isolationists or internationalists saw a need to give much thought to the future of Germany. To them, the victory in battle was all that was necessary. Once Warren Harding uh, was president, it was clear that 
clouds were gathering over the American occupation in Germany. He stated in one interview as early as uh, 1920 that once the USA had signed a peace with Germany, something which would eventually occur in August uh, 1920, American soldiers would return home from the Rhineland. The, uh, the president subsequently gave a clear summary of the uh, USA's role in Europe in his inauguration speech on 4th of March uh, 1921. He said, confident of our ability to work out our own destiny and jealously guarding our right to do so, we seek no part in directing the uh, destinies of the old world. We do not mean to be entangled. We will accept no responsibility except as our own conscience and judgment in each instance may determine. In the end, however, the early departure of American soldiers from the Rhineland did not occur. In June 1922, General Allen received a telegram from the Department of War authorizing him to continue to remain in Germany for the moment. So it wasn't until the next crisis, so-called the Ruhr crisis of the beginning of uh, 1923 when the, when the, uh, when the French and Belgian army occupied another part of Germany, the Ruhr, uh, then uh, the American position changed. Uh, another historian wrote that the American army uh, stay was always problematical and tenuous. It became a political football kicked about by those in the States desiring they recall and others insisting that an American presence was essential to Pacific Europe. All the more so since the US Senate failed to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. The final shot was taken by Secretary of State Charles Hughes when he threatened France that should it occupy the Ruhr, then the American units would leave Germany. In fact, however, there, were, uh, there was no time for the shot to play out with Senator Reed uh, submitting a resolution which demanded the withdrawal of the American army from the Rhineland. This was then approved with the majority of votes and thus ended America's occupation of Germany. Conclusion, although American occupation of the Rhineland lasted only four years and almost two months, the Americans played an important role in Germany. Along with Britain, they tried to resist, as I said before, they tried to resist attempts mainly by France at securing Rhineland's uh, secession from Germany. In occupying territory, the American army did not just fulfill a military role, but also helped the local population, in particular the children who suffered the most hardship. As such, many Germans looked back on the American soldiers with genuine gratitude long after they had left. Thank you for your attention.